Now, in 2001, uh, then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld published uh, in the Wall Street Journal a list of rules, reflections, and quotations under the title of Rumsfeld's Rules. Uh, it's a brilliant piece, uh, and I recommend it to you. It's easily um, found online. Uh, but one of those rules under the topic, Keep Your Bearings in the White House, uh, read like this. When asked for your views by the press or others, remember that what they really want to know is the president's views. Uh, so in that spirit, uh, let me surrender the podium immediately to my boss, uh, who will make some remarks and introduce and have a discussion then with our main speaker. Please welcome the 12th president of Hillsdale College, now in his 11th year in that position, Dr. Larry Arne. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. We've survived the afternoon rains. You know, up in Hillsdale, Michigan, it, it gets really cold. And uh, we didn't get a spring this year. And uh, we attribute that to the weather prognostications of Albert Gore. <laughs> and I see he's been very helpful to your weather down here, too. Uh, the trustees here tonight are, uh, they didn't get their names called out, so I'm going to call them out because I want to ask one of them and his daughter to stand up. They're uh, Gunnar Klar and Mark Johnson and Jack Stalsby along with Bill Broadbeck. And uh, Gunnar Klar is married to a Searle, and our speaker tonight ran G.D. Searle for some years and magnificently ran it. And so we have a family gathering here tonight from the Hillsdale College Board, and uh, one of the products of the Searle family his granddaughter, Abigail, who's just married a new guy. And he doesn't seem worthy to me, although Dad seems to like him. And so I'd like the Clars to stand up, please. Gunnar's married to Sally, and she's real pretty, as you can divine from looking at Abigail. And the son-in-law, you stand up too. See, that didn't look quite right, does it? <laughs> nice to have you here, young man. Torturing the young, that's what I do for a living. <laughs> and uh, Jack Stallsby over there has been driving me absolutely crazy about uh, Elizabeth Ames Jones, who stood up. P pol politicians are getting a lot better looking, aren't they? And uh, that's not why Jack likes her, though. She's apparently a woman of very good principle. And you should stand up again. You get three times then. <laughs> As you can tell so far, I'm, I'm feeling really gloomy. And there's a lot to be gloomy about. You know, tomorrow in New York, in a congressional election that Conservative candidates have been winning lately. It looks like uh, a liberal person is going to win the, the seat by running against the Paul Ryan proposals for entitlement reform. And Paul Ryan himself, I can tell you, thinks that if we don't get some kind of entitlement reform in the next three or four years, we're going to be submerged under our debt. That's a very bad sign. Europe is in a mess of insolvency and stagnation. The Arab Spring tends toward winter. Hezbollah and Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood prosper. The economy is slowing and the stock market is falling. Scott Walker of Wisconsin and Rick Scott of Florida and Nikki Haley of South Carolina and Chris Christie of New Jersey. I've met three of them lately and they're just awesome. But they're all too young to run for president right now, they think, and probably are. And Mitch Daniels has just said he's not going to do it. How will we ever get out of this mess? But two things make me hopeful. So, I'm, In fact, I'm not gloomy. I did uh, study Winston Churchill for some years and believe that's wrong to ever be that way. 
One of them is uh, what I see about me when I go to work. Uh, Ryan Walsh of recent Hillsdale College graduation has just been made the editor of the Law Review at the University of Chicago Law School. And uh, he likes to say that his colleagues who are on the Law Review at Harvard and Yale, and there are several of them, are weenies because in those places they don't give real grades. <laughs> and at Chicago they grade on a curve. And uh, Ryan is at the top. Applications to our college have gone up two and a half times in a decade. Applications to liberal arts colleges in general are falling. There are uh, 50 charter schools in uh, Texas whose chief today at lunch asked me if we would be prepared to supply them headmasters and curricula for all 50 of them. And uh, in the back of the room are several people who are going to end up doing that job, I can tell you, from the reception. <laughs> so one reason is there's hope, because there are people around who want to fight, and that's what makes a difference. Nothing else does. Come to find out, if you love good things and you can see them in your eyes and you can serve them with your heart, that is the strongest single force on earth, and it doesn't matter about these other things, however numerous or powerful they are, or however overwhelming they seem to be. And the second reason I'm not gloomy is because for the last three or four days, I've been studying the career of the person that's gonna to speak to us tonight. I've had the privilege of knowing him for a long time. He's the 13th and the 21st United States Secretaries of Defense, Secretary of Defense. And as you know, because you've all counted them up, in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, there are 17 clauses, and nine of them concern defense. And uh, since Henry Knox, the Secretary of Defense has always been one of the most important officers of the, in the American government, and our speaker tonight is one of the most illustri illustrious of them all. Now, it wouldn't surprise you that he's an aggressive man. He grew up in Illinois, and he's a wrestler. The first time I met him, he gave me a contribution. He was very nice, but of course he just beat the tar out of me the whole time we were talking. And he fastened onto the fact that I'm from Arkansas. And, and so he began to belabor me with that fact. What a miserable place that was to be from. <laughs> See, he's shaking his head now, but this is the God's truth. And he said, uh, and he said uh, you know, Arkansas, Illinois, that's where he's from, had produced Abraham Lincoln. And Arkansas had produced, you know. <laughs> and you know, he's, he's a great man and I am not. And so I was, I was very honored to be there and it was not, didn't seem like for a while a very equal contest until finally it made me mad. And I pointed out that it is true that Abraham Lincoln was so incomparably a better president than Bill Clinton that it's almost like it's not the same job when he's doing it. But on the other hand, Bill Clinton running for president had never carried Arkansas. <laughs> As you can see, I was like the fellow on the edge of the cliff holding on by his fingernails. And there was this big bully up there and he was standing on them. He was a naval aviator. He was an Eagle Scout, of course. He was a naval aviator. He was a congressman for four terms in a row. He was a good congressman. That is to say, if it was a question of voting for the strength of our country located in its military, but behind that and more profoundly in the freedom and the energy and the latitude to act of the American people. He was a supporter and a nourisher of the taproot of America. Somehow he figured out how to do that. He was called away by Nixon 
to work in the Nixon administration, and Nixon referred to him as a really tough guy. He surely is that. He was the transition chairman for Gerald Ford into the White House, and then he became the chief of staff, and that's when he began to, run, to write those famous Rumsfeld rules, which you must look up on the internet. He told me tonight maybe he'll write a book about that, and I can tell you his current book, which he was signing tonight. If you haven't read it, you should read it, because it has two things about it that are remarkable, and I speak as somebody who uh, helped to write the biography of Winston Churchill, the big one. Uh, he, he wants to demonstrate things with documentary evidence taken from the time. And there's, he tells me, a website, I haven't been there, where there are hundreds, thousands of documents published that you can go look up the truth. In other words, he wishes to demonstrate a thing. And, you know, the wish to prove a thing is an act of charity. That's what you do for people you respect. Uh, think of the fact that uh, Ronald Reagan's speeches, like Winston Churchill's speeches, were beautiful explanations. He took the trouble to make it clear, to tell you why it was good, to explain to you, to work to make it in terms comprehensible to you. And then follow the patterns of speech of the current occupier of that position. I swore I wouldn't mention his name, so I won't. <laughs> Our speaker has been the, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency and the president's personal representat representative of the Middle East. He shook the hand of Saddam Hussein. Little did he know that Saddam was shaking the hand of the man who would kill him. Like a lot of people who've become important in politics, Secretary Rumsfeld has done well for himself economically. Unlike almost all of them, he actually did that in a private capacity in competition with other people. <laughs> Not writing a book, telling dirty stories about his comrades. There are no dirty stories in this book, although the truth will out if you will read carefully and you will see the record of what's happened. He'll talk about that some tonight, I imagine. And he didn't do it by lobbying the government for stuff. He ran it, he did it by running two big companies in exactly the same spirit as he ran various important uh, departments in the United States government. I've thought of him for a long time now. He's been one of my favorite people for a long time, even though he was mean to me. <laughs> because uh, our, the story of our nation, if you just read it, is written in the history of people who were independent citizens, who came from nowhere the way any American does, the whole country does, who went into public service, who made their living independent of that, who served for nothing in most of the jobs they held. He's done that over and over. And who on the other hand, didn't think that when they went into politics, it was a reward for something they had achieved. It was an honor to be there and serve, an honor that can only be vindicated by the service that is honest and obedient. Rumsfeld's rules are about the people that you must obey, above all, the people of the United States of America, and secondarily, the people that they have elected. Churchill said once, no longer civil, no longer servants. That is the plague of the age. Our speaker tonight is an exception to it. Welcome, Donald Rumsfeld.
Now I've got the mic. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Where do you find people like that? <laughs> First of all, I'm delighted to be here. I'm a, a fan of Hillsdale. I don't want him to know it, but I'm a fan of Larry Arne. I uh, have the privilege of having a Hillsdale graduate work in my office, and she's terrific. I um, thought what I would do is talk for about three or four minutes and then sit down and respond to the questions that you ask. and. Uh, We'll see if I answer any of his, but, but I did spend four years working on the book, Known and Unknown. I enjoyed it. It was a long gestation period. The, Larry mentioned that on www.rumsfeld.com, I've got over 3,000 documents that the book is rooted in. There is an enhanced ebook that someone can actually read a paragraph in the book, go to the endnote, and then pull up the entire document. I don't know that that's been done before. You notice he was working off his iPad. I, I want the record to show I didn't bring mine. <laughs> the, the, um, the, the book is something that I hope people will read, partly because the proceeds, my proceeds, not the publishers, but my proceeds are going to the troops and their families and to the children of those who've fallen, military <laughs> charities. I, I, I also hope people read it, and I think, you know, if you want to get your Christmas card list and buy a lot of them and send them all out, it's, it's a good cause, but I hope people will read it who are interested in government, seriously interested, because I think they'll find in there uh, how things are really decided, how things work in government. And the fact that policymakers at that level, all the easy decisions get made down below, but they're faced with incomplete information, imperfect information, sometimes inaccurate information. And, and I've tried to show that those issues have two sides, that there are different approaches that one can take, that there are pros and cons for those kinds of issues. And, and I hope that from that, people will feel a, the importance of public service, that, uh, in fact, there's a, um, a speech in there on public service that I, in the website that I hope people will go to, and, uh, and, and particularly young people. I, I think that it can get pretty discouraging when people read the press and watch television, public service can. Uh, and, and I'm a great believer in the private sector, believe me. That's where the jobs come from, that's where the products come from, that's where the opportunities come from, that's the thing that distinguishes this wonderful country. But I also think that the people who have a background in, in business and, and the private sector can bring a lot to government uh, because that balance, that perspective, is, is critically important. So with that, I'll say that I will go and put my, whatever it's called, back on, and, and we'll start. Thank you. Good. Are you going to do this without your iPad? No, I have it right here. Okay. And the reason right. is... I was worried. And the reason is, I have your book on it. And I'm a, I was about to say the phrases are not memorable enough that I don't need to consult them, but that's not even true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just see what he's like? <laughs> it's terrible. No. <laughs> he says, so I'm not going to ask this question first. This, this concerns something I'll save to last. And uh, Secretary, thank you again for being here. Thank you. It's an honor to us all. Um, is it wise to support the uh, removal of Assad of Syria? 
or should we keep doing what we're doing? I don't know that anyone's trying to remove him uh, first. In fact, there have been a series of administrations that have hoped that he would behave and that that regime would behave. Indeed, recently, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, Mrs. Clinton, announced that he was a reformer, <laughs> which I hadn't noticed. <laughs> We've had a series of, of government officials traipse into, into Damascus to meet with um, the Assad family. I, I have met with his father. I have not met this one. Is that echoing funny? Is that better? Yes. Good. Um, and and if, if you look at that part of the world, what's really important, it seems to me, is Iran and Syria. They're linked at the hips. Iran's working on nuclear weapons, and they, their closest linkage and ally in uh, Syria are the ones that are supporting terrorist organizations and causing difficulties in Lebanon and elsewhere in the world. Certainly, they're causing difficulties in Afghanistan and Iraq. The world would be a considerably better place without the Assad family. Um, what would replace him is the question, and one can't know that. It's, it's not knowable. It is a known unknown. <laughs> the, uh, the, the other important parts of that world, I would say, are Egypt with 60 million people. And, uh, and Saudi Arabia and the Gulf, where the, the anchors there, considerably more important than Libya or Yemen or Tunisia or some of the other countries. In, in your book, you uh, follow up on that. You call for, uh, your suggestion is that we might have followed somewhat more limited objectives in Iraq than the ones we have followed. And I wonder if you could comment on that and how that might apply to a place like Syria. I've never believed that it's possible for our country or possible. It's still actually funny, isn't it? Higher is better. How's that? We'll try it. Um, bad. Who's in charge of this? My father would say, if the car wasn't working, there's a nut loose behind the steering wheel. <laughs> Here you go. It should be on this side. So when you talk, talk in the oh, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Did he say what I thought he said? <laughs> Let's have another question. <laughs> so, did you hear that question? I heard that, it. That was a good question. You liked that one. Yeah, let me ask you in some other way. Can we be players in a world with China? Oh my goodness, yes. Who would ask that? I don't know, would you hold up your hand? <laughs> <laughs> China, you know, I read all this stuff about China, and China's a big country, uh, although it looks like India may end up being larger in size. Uh, China has a, a good growth rate, and uh, they're investing in their military capabilities. But they've got problems. Uh, they've got difficulties with some of their neighbors, and Vietnam and India, and, and even uh, occasionally with uh, Russia. They had this one baby policy, which led to a, uh, not very many female babies and a lot of male babies. And that's a, a problem that they're going to face, a serious problem that they're going to face. They've got a lot of different ethnic groups uh, in, the, in the country, some of them uh, not comfortable with the central government. They have a disparity, a very wealthy coast and a, and a not so wealthy rest of the country. Um, they still have large government entities that have to eventually are terribly inefficient or are going to have to be uh, dropped out and they, they run the risk of, of uh, turmoil and, and protests and the like. Um, they have this basic problem of, of an uh, increasingly free economic system, which is benefiting them, but a less free and unfree political system. And one has to believe that there, that is not going to be perfectly compatible over time. 
So I, th I think that the, uh, you know, wringing our hands and worrying about China is probably not something we need to do. We, we need to behave ourselves and manage our relationship with them and, and, uh, and recognize that they play a long game. They, they, they don't play checkers or even chess. They play multi-dimensional chess. And um, they're busy around the world. They're, they're clearly developing a much um, stronger military. But they're also out dispensing money in different parts of the world, giving a soccer stadium to this country and a presidential palace to that country and uh, assisting with a yacht for some potentate somewhere else trying to, to buy friendship. And they, and they do a pretty good job of it. And, and, uh, uh, but they're, they're, they're an uncomfortable neighbor for all their neighbors. And uh, the fact that India is a freer system and a growing system and will be playing a bigger part in the world, I think is probably a, not a bad balance. Uh, so I, I think we ought to keep our eye on what they're doing and, and, and try to manage our, I can't imagine that they think it's in their interest, for example, to go after Taiwan. Uh, they, they've been deploying all kinds of ballistic missiles and aimed at Taiwan and, and threatening, but the economic back and forth between Taiwan and the mainland today is extensive. And uh, I, I can't believe they, they're going to, I mean, they clearly wanted to reunify greater China, and they brought Macau in, and they brought Hong Kong in, and they love to have Taiwan come in, but I, I, I think the idea of their doing it militarily in, in the near term is, is highly unlikely. Are there things we should be doing militarily to match them that we're not doing? Well, you know, what our country seems to do is at the end of World War II, we, we take a sigh of relief and cut the defense budget. And then after Korean War, we sigh of relief and cut the defense budget. And then after Vietnam, we cut the defense budget. And you end up dra doing a bathtub and drawing down our intelligence capabilities, drawing down our military capabilities. And we did it after the end of the Cold War. And the, the decade of the 90s, another bathtub. And it was harmful. And when President George W. Bush came in, the intelligence capabilities had been thinned out, and our military capabilities had declined. Uh, and and uh, if we do it again, simply because the the problems we've got with debt are crushing, we have to do something about it. The people who are running around saying you can balance the federal budget off the Defense Department are just wrong. The, the entitlements is where it is. And uh, when I went to Washington in 1957 and served in the 60s, the defense budget was about 10% of the gross domestic product of our country during the Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson period. Today, I think it's 3.8%, something like that. So it's, it's not as though the defense budget is what's causing the trillions of dollars of debt and deficits. It is, it is unquestionably in the entitlement area, and there is no other way to tackle it, and we must tackle it. Here's a question about Russia. Do, do, you, do you think they're on a good track, or are they going to be a problem for us? Or? Well, they've got a lot of nuclear weapons, uh, but the country is in trouble. They've got problems with alcoholism. They've got problems with tuberculosis, they've got a large prison population, they have a military where a lot of the conscripts in the enlisted ranks don't want to be there. They have an outflow of technical competence and well-trained scientific people. Um, yeah, I think it's the first industrialized country in the world that has actually had a, a declining uh, life expectancy for males. Um, their GDP is probably the size of Portugal, if you take out their energy component. And uh, it, it is not a bright prospect for Russia. It's not well run. Uh, they're kind of reverting to more of an authoritarian system, less of a democratic system. And, uh, and their behavior is, uh, I mean, if you're, if you're a businessman and this room's filled with them and you're sitting in Dallas or Chicago or somewhere else and you want to know where to, put a marketing arrangement or where you want to put a scientific uh, development, uh, research and development plan or you want to put a manufacturing plant and you look around the world, I mean, you look for certain things. You look for rule of law, you look for 
uh, educational systems, and you look for an environment that's hospitable to enterprise. And this, the Russia does not offer an environment that's hospitable to enterprise, so which suggests to me that people all across the globe will be, except in the energy area, people are going to be making decisions to go somewhere other than Russia. And, and that doesn't bode well for them. And of course, who do they hang around with? They walk around with, with uh, Cuba and Venezuela and, and Syria and Iran. Um, Some of the same allies we've got. <laughs> <laughs> Who's in charge here? <laughs> Uh, given the uh, economic troubles you mentioned in the debt, somebody wonders, is it time to uh, bring our troops home and get out of all these countries we're in spread around the world? Well, I think, I think we do have to watch where we position our forces. Uh, when President Bush came in, he asked me to work on rebalancing our forces. They were kind of left over from the Cold War, and, and they were in some places uh, where the countries were not terribly hospitable. They were in some places where the, for us to move them to do something in our national interest required that we go to the government and then they go to their parliaments. Uh, and, and we don't need that. We don't need one military for the United States and one for Germany and one for Japan and one for Korea. So we started moving them around in ways that they're much better positioned today. But I, I do think that, that uh, we, we have limits, and, and we don't need to be in a, a lot of places. Uh, I'll give you one little example of, of how hard change is. We were spending $236 million uh, to have um, Air Force capabilities in Iceland when I arrived in 2001. $236 million a year. And the planes had been put there to track uh, Soviet bombers. The Soviet Union had been gone for a decade. We seem not to realize that. It took me four and a half years, as I recall, to get that moved out of there at a cost of $236 million a year. Nobody wanted to do it. They wanted to leave everything the way it was. That's just one example of, of the difficulty of contending with the Iron Triangle in Washington, D.C., the, the permanent bureaucracy in the Pentagon, the Congress, and the contracting community. And, in this case, the State Department that didn't want to rock the boat with the Icelanders. And, to some extent, with some of our NATO allies that didn't want Iceland to be upset because those aircraft were serving a very important purpose for Iceland. They were doing search and rescue for the Iceland fishing fleet at $236 million a year. Now that's just one example of, of the things we were doing and, and in some instances still are doing that we ought not to be doing, that we don't need to be doing, and that we shouldn't be doing given the, the, the debt. I mean, we're be, I was with an Asian statesman not too long ago and he said to me he never thought he'd live to see adults in the White House in the United States of America modeling America on Europe. And, and uh, with the debt we have, we can't be doing those things that we don't need to do. There, and any, and you know, I'm, I don't mean to suggest you can't cut the defense budget. The Congress every year jams about $10 billion down the Pentagon's throat that they don't want, that has nothing to do with defense at, at all. Totally unrelated to the Defense Department. Before, I'm remembering, before the war started, when you were Secretary of Defense the second time, there was some conflict. There were Pa articles in the paper about how you were trying to cut precious things and there was resistance. Yeah. How would you go about reform in the military today? What changes would you make to it? Well, um, I mean, the, 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 one of the big things that happened was I cut the Crusader artillery piece. Isn't that a wonderful name in, in the environment we're in? Uh, this thing was so big it I, took... I you kind of like it? Yeah. <laughs> it, it took two large cargo aircraft to move the thing and a long period to assemble it. And 
it, here we are dealing largely with unconventional threats and asymmetrical threats. And I just made a judgment that we'd be much better off with high, very good precision artillery capability and, and to cancel that, I cancel it. And you'd think the roof would fall in it. I mean, it was just, there's so much momentum behind a major weapon system uh, in, in, in Washington once it gets going. The jobs, the contractors, the congressmen who are committed to it, the people in the building who, who uh, had worked on it for, you know, 8, 10, 12 years. And no one wants to stop anything like that. And, and uh, here we are, what, uh, 10 years later, and nobody thinks we should have left it today. I mean, it just, it was wrong. And that is hard to do. Um, you know, but if you're gonna get traction, I suppose you first have to have friction. And, and. See, it's, that means that it's not just uh, listening to the experts because they want the weapon. And it's not just overriding them. It takes, how, how do you do that? How do you figure that out so you do the right thing for the public? Well, you, you, uh, you talk to all the people who have knowledge that you don't have, and, and then you kind of calculate how, wh how much pain for the game, because you can only do so many of those things. And back, back in 1975, the, at about 7 o'clock at night, and I talk about this in the book, uh, in came the Army and the acquisition people uh, from the OSD. And the issue was the main battle tank for the United States of America. And the Army decided they wanted to recommend 105 howitzer and a diesel tank, which is what we'd always had. And the acquisition people in OSD decided they wanted a 120 millimeter howitzer because it was more compatible with our NATO allies. And they wanted a, a turbine engine instead of a diesel engine. And it was 7 o'clock at night, and the, everyone expected me to agree with them, and they were totally in. So I said, look, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to wait six, six, seven, eight weeks, which we did. And I poured my head into it and concluded that the Army was wrong and that we should go for the 120 howitzer and the turbine engine. We did, and it performed. And, of course, the Congress went nuts. The contracting community went nuts. There were hearings. It was sacrilegious to not agree with the Army. How could you do that? And the retired community was up in arms. And, and in the Gulf War, the tanks performed brilliantly, and, and the, the armored people very, really like the Abrams tank today. Now, the pain from that was enormous. You know, the headline in the Army Times was, why does Rumsfeld hate the Army? That, that kind of thing. But, but I guess that's just the way it is. Uh, somebody has to decide, and, and uh, you can't agree with everybody. Uh, and if you make those decisions, um, there'll be people who won't like it. And if you're not willing to do that, you, you shouldn't be in government. I once uh, counted up the years, incidentally, uh, in which uh, Winston Churchill was in government, in, in, in ministry, in which he was fighting for a smaller, and the years in which he was fighting for a larger defense estimates, they call it in England, and the years where he was fighting for a smaller one outnumbered the years where he was fighting for a larger one. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Isn't that something? Yeah. yeah. He was pugnacious, too. <laughs> That, that was a compliment. <laughs> what do you think of the Tea Parties, and is a restoration of constitutional government in America a real possibility? I think the Tea Party is a good thing. It shows that there's energy out there in the country. People are interested, and and you know, throughout our history, if if, if things get out of whack. At, at some point, good people get out of their chairs and spend more time, and they push the pendulum back where it belongs. And I, I kind of take the Tea Party as doing that today, that, that things have, have tipped too far, and, uh, and the concern is, is greater, so people who may not have been involved previously decided they want to get involved. And I personally think that's a good thing. We, we, uh, we benefit in our country 
having that kind of uh, recalibration, which occurs when a larger number of our population decide they're going to uh, do what a lot of the folks in this room do, uh, even, even before, uh, where they say they want to help guide and direct the course of the country because they think the course of the country isn't where it ought to be going. Anybody here remember the Tea Party? Oh, this is good. What has been your best moment in politics and your worst? Well, this is going to sound ridiculous, but, but you didn't even mention that I was in charge of the wage price controls that Richard Nixon <laughs> imposed on our country. And, and, and this is, you think it's the worst, it happens to be the best. And I'll explain why. It, it, in, in government, it rarely comes out exactly the way you want it. There's too many people pulling and tugging. But in this instance, it did. Here's what happened. George Schultz came to me and said, President, and I want you to run the wage price controls. I said, that's nice, George, but I don't believe in them. And he said, I know, Don. That's why we want you to do it. <laughs> So I started doing it, and what I did was, the first thing I said was, oh my goodness, it's an election period, and we've got the power over wages and prices in the United States. Now, is that a formula for corruption? <laughs> and people started coming to me and say, oh, we can, we can remake America in our image here. We can control wages and prices and fix the health care system. Or we can control wages and prices and damage the unions or we can control wages and prices and help the unions. And I said, we're not going to do anything other than deal with inflation. That's why the legislation was passed. Doesn't matter who comes in and wants what. We're not going to do anything other than that, number one. Number two, every time there's a regulation, we're going to stick it on the side of the wall and, and see the damage we're doing as it grows up the side of the wall. Third, if there's even a smell of corruption, we're going to send it to the Department of Justice instantaneously. And fourth, we're not going to have a single employee who's permanent. Everyone here is going to be detailed from another department so you can get rid of them in one second. And nobody, you don't end up with a whole bunch of people who want to perpetuate themselves in that job. We did that, then we said we're going to start letting everyone go. Not everyone. We, 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 we tiered them. We had the big companies, the medium size, and the small. We let all the small out. Don't worry, go your way. The middle, we asked just report periodically. And the big ones that have all the lobbyists and all the lawyers, they were the ones that we dealt with. At one point, Milton Friedman called me up and he said, Don, you are doing a terrible job. I said, Milton, we are doing a spectacular job. We are letting everyone out from under this so that no pressure will build. And, and he said, you are doing a terrible job because you are doing such a good job. People are going to think that wage price controls work. And they're, and they're going to get the wrong lesson from all of this. I, <laughs> I told them not to worry, we're going to get rid of these things, and we did. <laughs> now, everyone here knows that Milton Friedman was a Nobel Prize winning economist, a monetarist. You know, I knew him myself very well, really great guy. He spoke for the college about three months before he died. And you had a big relationship with him. You knew him for a long time. Tell, tell about him and about what you learned from him. Oh, he was, he was just wonderful as a human being. He had this great energy and love of life and sparkle. Um, he came to me, I met him first in the early 1960s when I was in Congress and I was at a conference at the University of Chicago Center for Continuing Education and the subject was the draft. And um, he got me interested in, in moving from a compulsory military draft system to an all-volunteer army. And I ended up testifying in the Congress uh, for an all-volunteer army. And of course, 
there was a funny thing going on. The military liked the compulsion because it was the only thing in our society where we forced people to do something. It was the only single vocation or activity of government where we required that people do it. The academic community liked it because they got an exemption. So <laughs> teachers didn't have to do it, students didn't have to do it, anyone who was married didn't have to do it, women didn't have to do it, conscientious objectors didn't have to do it. And then we turned around to the handful that we did make do it under the, the draft system and told them we're going to pay you 60, 50, 60, 70 percent of the civilian manpower market. Not only are you not going to be able to do what you want, and these other people can, uh, but we're going to pay you much less. I remember going to a PTA meeting with one of my daughters, and the, it was a history class, and, and they showed the reading list. And I looked up there, every book had been written in the last 15 minutes. <laughs> and I went up to the guy and I said, is this history or current events? He said, it's history. I said, how'd you happen to become a history teacher? He said, I didn't want to go in the draft. <laughs> so, so Milton Freeman talked me into it, and sure enough, Richard Nixon, thanks to him, he pushed it through. And, and, uh, and the system we have today is working brilliantly. We've got a terrific members and, uh, men and women in the armed forces of the United States. They do a great job. They're there because they want to be there. And they all raised their hands and said, send me, and, and we're so fortunate that, that they're there doing what they do. And, and, and Milton Friedman was a big pusher for that. You notice I didn't answer the last part of the question. Yeah, I don't intend to. I, I met you before I surmised that. I could ask again and then we'd just get the same point again. What, what, in your, what made you interested in public life? Why did you go into public service? Well, my dad was an old man. He was 38 or 9 when World War II broke out. And he had a wife and kids, and he volunteered to go in the Navy, and they didn't want him. He was, you know, he didn't fit what they were looking for. And, uh, and then we started losing battle after battle in the Pacific, and pretty soon they took him. And uh, he was out in the Pacific on a carrier, and, and, you know, when you're young, I was, well, I was, I was nine years old in 1941, and... Uh, it's, you're, you're impressed by that. And I was around military bases and lived in Coronado when he was out in the carrier. And I, I got interested in the war. I was interested in, in the military. I was interested in public service. I was interested in President Roosevelt because he was the president of the United States and, and was the commander in chief. And I began reading and thinking about it. I went to college and uh, Adlai Stevenson spoke at my senior banquet in college. And, gave this, his speech is on my website also, and it was a wonderful speech about public service. It was, it was a really inspirational. Uh, he was a fine speaker and uh, probably would not have been a very good president. He lost to Eisenhower twice, as you all know, but, uh, but the speech is a good one. And then I went in the Navy, and uh, I, I started in government at, uh, right out of college as a pilot and flight instructor. And uh, I read history, read biography, which I guess is history without theory, isn't that right? Something like that. <laughs> isn't that what Disraeli said? I think. You should know. <laughs> See, I, I could lie to him and agree with him. <laughs> but with this guy, you don't know if he's not going to turn on it after you do that. So. <laughs> So the, the sorry truth is, I'm going to obey one of Rumsfeld's rules, which is, if, if you don't know, say that, and if you do it the right amount, it will be often. I don't know. <laughs> the other one is, if in doubt, don't. If still in doubt, do the do right what, thing. Do what's right. That's right. That was my dad. I'm going to read you the quote from Adlai Stevenson. The book ends with it. By the way. You should read this book. It's, it's a, it, do you ever read books by politicians? Well, the point is, if they're any good, they didn't write them. And this one's good, and I happen to know, because the, the young woman in question is Eliza Quietek, graduated second or third in her class three or four years ago, really bright. 
really great parents, people from Dayton, Ohio. And uh, apart from my own perceptions of the secretary, one of my girls has been working for him for some years. She thinks he hung the moon. She was the fact checker. Yeah. Here's how the book ends. Our still young country has withstood tragedies and trauma of unimagined scope. This is Rumsfeld writing. And yet it has continued to thrive thanks to proud and resilient citizens and leaders from both political parties who have done their best to guide the nation. Quote, if those young Americans who have the advantage of education, perspective, and self-discipline do not participate to the fullest extent of their ability, America will stumble. And if America stumbles, the world falls. For the power for good or evil of this American political organization is virtually beyond measure. The decisions which it makes, the uses to which it devotes its immense resources, the leadership which it provides on moral as well as material questions, all appear likely to determine the fate of the modern world. Then Rumsfeld writes, these words remain as true and profound today as when I first heard them at my senior class banquet in 1954 at Princeton. It's, it's a speech worth looking at on the website, the Stevenson speech, if people are interested in public service or you know young people who might be. Uh, you've been beat up a little bit in uh, interviews about your book, people, some, somebody here notices. What's that about? Why, why, why is there an animus against you from those who have it? Well, the, there's a narrative out there, and uh, it, I'm, I'm guessing it was basically written by journalists who weren't there, weren't involved in the decisions. It was written by authors who talked to people in many cases that were two or three levels down. And uh, it's got to be jarring to have a book come out that is counter to the narrative. And in some instances, it is. And, and that's awkward for people who are, in, are invested in the narrative and, uh, and their supporters, which is why I decided to take four years and, 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 and document the book with, I don't know, 1,300 endnotes and 3,000 some odd documents on the website because I, I knew there would be people who would find it inconsistent with the narrative. And, uh, and that's fine. Um, mine's right. <laughs> so uh, th this uh, something about something else about the book and about you remind me of Churchill. Um, the book is full of cautions of. Uh, trying to do too much with the military, of going too far, of expecting too much from settlements after wars are won, of on and on and on. Every, every well, I, I confess, I, I already told him. I always tell him the truth because he's quick and he'll make fun of you. But uh, I've read about 40% of the book and the last chapter. And, uh, and Don't I, you hate skimmers? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's an expert all of a sudden. Put it this way, this is a very fine book. If I read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, I read it more carefully. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right, all right, all right. If, if uh, but th that's a, first of all, that's a surprising thing. And by the way, read books by Winston Churchill. And this, they're good in the same way this book is. They're full of the same thing over and over again. The guy thinks that war is a devastating thing and you better be careful about it. And if you fight it, you better have a lot of respect for it. Now that's you on the one hand, and you on the other hand is the guy in September, October, and November 2001, and later when we Iraq stuff starts, and you perfect the use in public speech of the word kill, because there's a bunch of people we're about to go get, and you want them to be afraid, and so, it's like the career of Churchill, isn't it? He's the guy who stood up and said, what is our policy? It is to wage war, to wage war with all the strength that's in us, all the might that God can give us, right? Uh, I wrote a, a paper in, I think, March 
of 2001, well before September 11th, and it's also on the website, and it's called Guidelines for the Use of Military Power or Military Force, where I, I set down for the President uh, and members of the National Security Council some thoughts uh, about being careful about the use of, of military power and recognizing that there are certain things we can't do and, and understanding our limits. Uh, and uh, I reread it not too long ago and it, it still feels right. Um, I did another memo that's on there that someone called the Parade of Horribles. Uh, and, and it was before, before we went into Iraq Months, many months before, probably four, five, six, and I sat down and, and listed all the things that could go wrong, and all the things I could think of that would go wrong, and uh, brought them up in a National Security Council meeting, and then went back to the office and circulated it to three or four people and asked them to add things and, and calibrate it and polish it, and then we sent it around to the members of the National Security Council uh, what I should have done is also written something, all the things that could go wrong if we didn't go after Saddam Hussein. And I didn't do that, although at the bottom of the memo I said just that, that another memo could be written on that subject. And it was, a, it was an effort to try to remind all of us of the terrible things that could go wrong. And uh, one of them was there might not be stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction and the administration's credibility would be damaged. Uh, another was that it could go on six or eight or ten years. And uh, I didn't believe those things. I didn't think they would happen, but, but you, you sit down and you think, what could go wrong? Um, one of the things that went right was when Gaddafi saw Saddam Hussein being pulled out of that spider hole he decided he didn't want to continue with his nuclear program. And he called in the West, and they came in and dismantled it. And uh, we're, the world's a better place, uh, A, with Saddam Hussein gone, and B, that Gaddafi doesn't have a nuclear, a well-advanced nuclear program. You, you describe in the, in the book, uh, some change of goal about the Iraq war that you describe what's the limited thing you're after and, and, and then that the, the goal became democratization. Do you, could you elaborate on that a little bit and also explain, do you think it would have gone on this long or been this difficult if we'd stuck to the more limited goal? Well, you never know. You, you like to think you know, uh, but even hindsight's not 20-20. I look at it and for some reason the word democracy started being used with respect to Iraq and uh, for some reason I was uncomfortable with it. I, I kept wanting to use the word freedom and f a freer political system and a freer economic system. The word democracy left me with the impression that we had in mind a template and it was our template. It was our democracy as we exist today. And I just don't believe that, I mean, think of our country. We had slaves into the 1800s, women didn't vote into the 1900s. Uh, we fought a god-awful civil war, some, what, six or 700,000 Americans' lives lost. So what we are today is not what we were, and it's not what we will be in another 50 years, I suspect, we'll be something different. And each of those countries have different history, different culture, different experiences, different neighbors. And they're going to evolve in a way that fits them. Uh, I mean, Afghanistan's a tribal country. We're not. Uh, so the, I, the, the use of the word democracy worried me, not because I'm against democracy, but because I was afraid that it would mean to people that we were going to impose that template on other countries. And I much preferred the word freedom and uh, freer political systems. And the other thing is, I worry about being too judgmental about other countries. 
you know, you can, if this is the spectrum, and that's bad by our standards, unlike us, and this is good, the most like us, and a country's over here in the bad half, how do you deal with them? Or a country's here in the good half somewhere, how do you deal with them? My attitude is, which way are they moving? If someone's over here and he's going in the, they're going in the right direction, they're kind of doing things that are going to be best for their people. They're going to have a freer political system, a freer economic system, less likely to invade their neighbors, more likely to create opportunities for their people. That I think you encourage. If someone's over here, better than this, but they're going the wrong way then I think the task is to kind of encourage them. But I don't think we should expect everyone to be just like we are. Because it's a big world and we're going to have to deal with lots of countries that aren't like we are. Uh, if we only dealt with countries that were exactly like we are, we wouldn't have many people to deal with. Good. Very good. What can be done to keep Iran from becoming a nuclear power? Is it up to Israel? Well, my guess is probably. Uh, you don't see the UN, the quote, international community, which of course isn't a community at all. Uh, it's, it's a bunch of countries, and, and, uh, but they, they, they're so divided on this issue. And you're not gonna get the UN to take the kinds of steps that would would uh, create an, an, a circumstance inside of Iran that they would find it disadvantageous to have nuclear weapons. I'm out of date uh, by at least four years, and, but, but my recollection is the last time I looked, I was hoping at one point that the Iranian people would oppose the Ayatollahs and that they didn't, wouldn't want to be separate from the rest of the world and that they would see that nuclear weapons programs of the Iranian government were causing the Iranian people to be somewhat separated from the rest of the world. I mean, there's a big country, it's a proud country. Turns out, the last data I saw suggested that the Iranian people did want to not be disconnected from the rest of the world, but they, they were not opposed to a nuclear program. So that is, the, it turned out that that might not be the wedge that could separate the Iranian people from the, um, their leadership, the Ayatollahs. I don't know if that's still true, but, but I remember that having been true four, five, six years ago. And, uh, but but it, 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 it doesn't make sense to me that, that forever the Ayatollahs are going to be in charge of that country. I mean, I think those people at some point conceivably could overthrow the, uh, the government. And we, we missed an opportunity to help them and, and provide encouragement. Um, there may be other opportunities in the future. Certainly this administration isn't going to do anything with respect to the um, Iranian nuclear capability. Uh, the, the Israelis in the past, of course, took out the Iraqi nuclear capability and, and when they went in some many years ago now, more recently they dealt with Syrian nuclear capabilities and they, they have some capabilities to do these things, but it's complicated, it's not easy. And um, one has to believe the Iranians are arranging themselves in a way that it'll be difficult, so the best one could hope for would be to delay their program. Uh, but they, uh, or you know, who knows what's gonna happen. There's a split right now, possibly, between some of the uh, leaders, the president and, and some of the Ayatollahs over different issues, and um, there may be more things that can be done. And we just have to hope, uh, but, but ex sitting there hoping that the UN will step up and, and uh, show some um, leadership on it, I think, is, is uh, not going to happen. I just don't see them doing that. Our uh, alliance with Israel, is it still important? And what do you think its prospects are? It's, it's very important. Uh, it's, it's critically important to Israel. Uh, and uh, I think it's important to us. This is a country that's a democracy. 
it is, uh, it's been a, a friend and, and we've had a close relationship. Uh, not a formal alliance as such like we do at NATO or, or a treaty such as we have with South Korea or Japan. But it has been a country that we've cooperated with closely. It's a country that is in a hostile part of the world, hostile to them. Uh, fortunately, the arrangements that Sadat initiated, Mubarak followed up on, uh, for, provided a, a long period of stability in the region. And that's at risk right now. We don't know where the Egyptian situation is going to evolve. The, um, uh, the, the different forces tugging and pulling in there create a, a big question mark as to, as to who will prevail. And, and we know that, that extremists tend to be better organized and, and more vicious and more determined than, than disparate groups that have different opinions and aren't as well organized. So there's a risk, it seems to me, that uh, Egypt could end up with a, a, a government that might not um, be willing to continue its relationship with Israel that they had. And, and that puts Israel in a very tough spot. Uh, but, but we, um, for myself, I think it's important that we recognize the, uh, uh, the relationship and that we recognize the difficulty of their situation and, uh, and be a friend a strong friend and the deterrent effect of that is substantial and to the extent the deterrent effect is weakened we're we're asking for trouble and uh, this administration's relationship with Israel I think has been uh, imperfect at best and and dangerous uh, uh, in some respects the, the rudeness of it Somebody wants to know, is it possible to build a democracy in a Muslim country? Time will tell. Um, well, time will tell. I mean, the, I guess the, the closest thing you've got is what's going on in, uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. And, and that's imperfect. Uh, but they are finding their way. And the fact that it's imperfect, uh, so were we imperfect in various stages of our development. Um, and and uh, I, I don't know the answer. I know that there are notable differences in Iraq from our country and notable differences in Afghanistan from both Iraq and our country. And they're going to have to find their way. Uh, you, we can give them the opportunity, but we can't do it for them. And we can give them a chance to make it and, uh, and hope they do. Um, I don't know, maybe it's a bad way to think of it, but you know, if you've got a youngster and you're teaching them to ride a bike, you put your hand on the steering wheel, I'm a correction on the seat on a bicycle, and you run down the street with them and holding on, and then pretty soon you go to three fingers, and then you go to two fingers, and then you go to one finger, and they might fall and skin their knees, but if you don't let go, you're going to end up with a 40 year old that can't ride a bike. And uh, it, it, it's, you, you, you can't do it for them. And if the, the American people have a tendency to want to do it. If there's a ditch to be dug, by golly, we want to dig the ditch, and we can dig a darn good ditch. But if there's 15 million ditches to be dug, you darn well better teach other people how to dig a ditch and not expect that it'll be exactly the way we would have done it, because and, and it, it won't be. Don't you wonder about the... the, the questions that he rejects. <laughs> he, he goes through there and he, yeah, he smiles and he takes the one he likes and chucks the other one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and if you do wonder, keep wondering. <laughs> <laughs> what are the worst mistakes we made in Iraq? I suppose uh, not anticipating the insurgency, which kind of evolved in a, in a way, a hundred... Saddam Hussein let 100,000 prisoners out of the camps, his prisons, and, and the young military people that were let go out of the army didn't get paid for a period of, of many weeks. Um, Saddam Hussein called for jihad, and they started streaming in over the border. The um, party of return was the, what the Sunnis decided, 
And, uh, and then Al-Qaeda migrated in there and started working with the Sunnis, and the Sunnis were, made a big mistake to not participate in the government at the outset, and they played with Al-Qaeda until Al-Qaeda started raping their women and stealing their businesses. And uh, then they decided they didn't like that, and that led to the awakening. Uh, but a combination of those things conspired to create an insurgency of some intensity that had not been predicted or anticipated. And, uh, and it kept evolving in a, in a way that was different. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the way it eventually was dealt with was a combination of things that came together in a, in a very helpful way. Number one, the Sunnis got tired of Al-Qaeda. Uh, doing what they were doing and, and uh, migrated towards the uh, support of the Maliki government. Sadr, who was a problem, uh, he went quiet for some reason. He may have gone to Iran, but he went quiet. Uh, third, the Iraqi military and security forces were developed into the hundreds of thousands by then and, and equipped and were, uh, Petraeus was in, we put Petraeus in charge of it and he, uh, and, and then his successor, General Dempsey, uh, got the Iraqi forces up to a level that they could really make a difference in participating with our forces. And then, you know, George W. Bush, uh, by being bold and, and announcing the surge, the other thing was the Maliki government matured somewhat and actually got tough enough and went down south and did some damage damage in a good sense. And then President Bush, God bless him, uh, galvanized support in the United States. They, Senator Reid had already said the war's lost, it's over. And uh, he galvanized support in the United States with the surge. And his decision galvanized support in, uh, in Iraq because people were starting to think, well, they're going to pull out, the Congress is going to jerk the money away. And, and God bless him for it. He deserves a lot of credit in my view. I'll ask one more. So I, I understand that the uh, secretary has to drive down to Houston tonight, so I'm going to... cancel flight. Uh, can't get in and out of this place. So I'm going to ask you one more question, then I'm going to give you a chance to say whatever you want to say. And uh, uh, what is your opinion of... Uh, you can see why I saved this one. <laughs> President Obama's leadership in the war on terror. Oh, my. <laughs> Well, let me say this about that. <laughs> he campaigned, first of all, the structures that President Bush's administration put in place, um, I am absolutely convinced have helped to protect the American people for close to a decade. <laughs> the Obama people campaigned against most of them, against the Patriot Act, against indefinite detention, against Guantanamo Bay, against renditions, against enhanced interrogation techniques, waterboarding. And he then got into office, and he has reversed himself on most of them. Not completely reversed himself, but he has kept in place many of those structures that have, in my view, uh, helped to protect our country. He is still hoping he can close Guantanamo. Of course, everyone hopes you could close Guantanamo. But, uh, you know, if you're going to tear down what is, you darn well better have something better to put in its place, and no one's thought of what's better. Um, I think that, that he has been reluctant to uh, accept reality although in many instances now he has accepted reality. Um, he, the, the concept of leading from behind, as I think someone in his administration suggested, is, is worrisome. Uh, I don't know who you want in front. Uh, you know, is it Sudan or some other country that you can think of that you'd prefer to provide the guidance? I was asked one time why President Obama didn't go to Congress and ask for uh, authority to go into Libya. And I said he didn't know what to ask for. He hadn't decided. 
he, he instead of recognizing that the, the mission ought to determine the coalition, uh, where you decide what you want to do and then you get countries that want to do that, he decided he would go to NATO and the UN and get a coalition. And then they would decide what they were going to do, what their role was in Libya. And that is worrisome because it, 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 you're not going to get countries that are going to stay under the umbrella if you haven't, in the first instance, decided what it is you were going to do. And uh, so I, 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 I am personally one that, that believes that we have a great country, that it is not an accident that people are lined up all across the globe wanting to come here. And he seems not to feel that way. And I think that's unfortunate. Uh, and I, I hope that he'll begin to better understand what an amazing country this is and the fact that, that it... <laughs> but I, I, I think that the leadership he's providing is better than he started out but it still has a good ways to go. Thank you. Larry asked me if there's anything else. The only thing I would say is that, that I really do thank all of you for supporting uh, Hillsdale. It's a special place, and what you're doing is the right thing. It's a good thing. and. Uh, the leadership's questionable, but <laughs> but it's tough to get good help. <laughs> He's doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs>